4 through page 8. <laughs> when I first read this, I said, whoa. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, they hit you with all those comments. But anyway, <clears throat> it's on a good subject. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not even it does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always preserves. Love never fails. Amen. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah? No? Okay, making sure. Let's start with prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege that we have to be a part of your family. That in spite of our sins, you love us. That you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die for our sins, to restore us back to a right relationship with you that you have passionately pursued history of mankind for so long. And Father, we thank you and praise you that Jesus will return one day and take his church home. Lord, help us to be the church that we are called to be. Help us to be spirit-filled. Help us to be a light to this world. Help us to love one another. And Lord, we just pray your spirit upon this place today as we study your word and as we have our fellowship and our times of eating and our times of business, Father. May we bring glory and honor to you and may we give the gifts that you have given us to build up this church to proclaim your, world to the, your word to the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, love is part of what this sermon's about. And I didn't know this was in my little thing, but this is a prime little example of love. This is done for me and given in love by my special friend Denise. Thank you. I didn't even know it was in there. So I just saw that and it made my day. So I entitled this sermon, Love for All of God's People. Maybe you remember what last week's sermon was on, maybe you don't. When we were talking about music this week, I asked each person, what was last week's sermon on? And I got a deer in headlights look. <laughs> Paul wrote letters to churches, congregation, those called out because they were born again by the Spirit of God to be united as a people, to be united as the body of Christ, to keep the message going that Jesus preached while he was here on this earth in the flesh. We are now the body of Jesus Christ. Don't forget that. We are called out to be like Christ, to love one another, even to lay down our lives for our friends, to be strong in our faith, to trust and believe in Jesus Christ and nothing else, because if you put your trust and faith in anything else, it's going to let you down. It's going to fail you. But not Jesus. Jesus' love for you is real. It is the way, the truth, and the life. It will bring you joy and peace and comfort. It will bring you strength and encouragement. Yes, we still are called to walk through this world. And this world will be full of trouble, even suffering. And Christ said, don't worry. And why would you not expect to suffer if I, your Lord, have suffered for you? Jesus Christ suffered and died to put us back to a right relationship with God. It all starts because God so loved the world that He would send His only begotten Son. And whoever believes and trusts and puts their faith in Him will have without a doubt eternal life. Last week I talked a little bit about Colossians. The week before we read the letter of Colossians. That's one of Paul's many letters. 
Paul, remember who Paul is, he's definitely a born-again Christian. He was trying to stamp out Christianity, followers of Jesus Christ. He was trying to murder them and put them in the grave so that they would not profess what they believed until he had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And it changed him. He was born again, a new creation in Christ. If God can use somebody like Saul to become Paul, He can use each and every one of us in a mighty way. So Paul wrote letters to these different churches. He wrote the letter to the Colossians. Probably had never been there, but he had heard about them. So he wrote this letter. I've mentioned a couple times a letter that he wrote to the Thessalonian church. And he wrote that letter to the church in Thessalonica because people were telling them, Hey, you guys don't know what you're believing. Jesus has already come again, and you missed the boat. <laughs> so he writes this letter about their love and their encouragement and says that, that this is not true. And we see the same pattern here. But then we have other letters. We have letters to the Galatians, which I'll talk a little bit about today. And that letter's not so encouraging. We have a letter we're going through and studying for the, to the church in Corinth. And that was a church that was so divided among themselves envy and greed, all the things that Merle said that love is not, they were guilty of. They desired the, the best gifts, and Paul tells them that love is the best gift of all. But yet they hoarded it over others, lorded it over others, and said, I have a better gift than you do. I'm more righteous than you are. How is that being like Jesus Christ, who thought equality with God was something to not be taken for his advantage? but instead humbled himself and became a man and laid down his life to save you and I. So we're going to look at what love is. But Colossians started this way. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all of God's people. If you don't remember what I talked about last week, I dissected that verse and I said, Paul wrote this letter because of the first thing, he heard about your faith in Jesus Christ. If your faith is in anything other than Jesus Christ, then maybe you ought to stop right this second and think about that. Because if it's any other thing than Jesus Christ, you're slapping God in the face for sending his only son to die on the cross for you. You're saying, yes, I thank you for, for Jesus and everything, but I'm still going to hold on to this for my salvation, whether it's works, whether it's your pride, whether whatever it is. Jesus said, if you're not with me, you're against me. If you're not gathering into the fold, you're scattering. He will be your Lord if He is in fact your Savior. That's my spin. That's not a verse. But it's clear that Jesus said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I tell you to do? He who loves me will keep my commandments. So the first thing that Paul heard about this church was their faith in Jesus Christ. Not their faith in Jesus plus something. Not their faith in something else. Not in a watered down faith. But in a faith that changed their lives and it was evident. We're starting to see more children come in here. <laughs> and guess what? It's not because they've seen our faith. Now, you can be mad at me all you want to for saying that, but it's because Jesus is building His church. Thank goodness that God is faithful. You can look, if you're reading the Old Testament through, you should be getting close to the end of Genesis now. And I've just put on the bulletin through the end of Genesis. I'm not going to put it after that. You're either reading along or you're not. You either took that challenge to read along with me and Sherry, or you haven't. And let me tell you what the challenge has done in our household. One of the two of us, usually Sherry, says to me, are you where you need to be in your Bible reading? And I'm glad she does that because I am reading and studying Corinthians. I am reading Colossians. I am reading Galatians. So then I think, oh, maybe I don't have time to keep up with this. And she says, are you up with me? I want to talk about this. Wow. We're spending time together, keeping both of us accountable, reading these. She's even got a diagram of all the different sons and the generations and stuff. I don't know why she's doing it, <laughs> but she's doing it. 
and I'm tickled. And we sit down and talk about this and that. And then I'll say something or she'll say something. And I'm like, I don't really remember it that way. So we'll go back and read it again and discuss it. It is wonderful that we're spending that time together that we committed to it. Now, I don't know if you did or didn't. If you didn't, you can still play catch up. It's not too late. We're not quite one month into it. 28 days is day the 28th, right? Four weeks, roughly, if that's right. Then 15 minutes a day for four weeks means that you could be totally caught up in what? Seven hours? You could be caught up? Even throw in your extra 15 minutes a day to get you there. No more than, than a week's worth of reading, an hour and 15 minutes a day, you could be caught back up. So don't give me an excuse that you can't do it now. You're too far behind. Okay? And you know what's happening in our household less? Less and less TV and other things too. And more and more reading of God's Word. Hmm. Maybe we'll get to Deuteronomy 6 where we talk about it when we get up and when we go to bed and we sit down and everything else because that's again what we're commanded to do. And God is faithful. He will faithfully bring our children back when they see our faith. The second thing that Paul heard about was their love for all of God's people. Or maybe you have the saints, the holy people, those set apart, those born again, called by God to proclaim His Word, to be the hands and feet of Christ, to be, to be the body of Christ, whatever your version has. Paul heard about two things, their faith and their love for one another. Now, I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult to love other people. But Christ again said to love others as you love yourself. Paul goes on to say to put others' needs above yourself because isn't that exactly what Jesus Christ did? And that's what brought us our salvation is that Christ humbled Himself, thought of others' needs more than His own and went to the cross willingly to lay down His life to save us. So what is love? If you read in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, right before you get to 13 at the end, Paul says, I will show you the most excellent way. And then he starts out the chapter with, with telling you that if he had all the gifts of tongues, even tongues of angels. Now we don't read about that in Scripture anywhere else much, but so many times people like to get focused on what is that tongues of angels. Paul didn't say that there was even a tongue of angels. He said, if I have the gift of tongues of men and if I have the gift of angels. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. I'm sure they communicate. I'm sure it's not English. <laughs> we tend to think that we're the, the, the way when our church is not near as alive as a lot of the churches in this world are. Why is that? Because we're watered down because of the things of this world. We're distracted maybe we don't realize what Jesus did for us on the cross. But he says, even if I have these gifts of tongues, but I don't have love, I'm just making noise. That's all I'm doing. Then he goes on to say, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all things, all the mysteries of God and everything else, but I don't have love, then I am nothing. The word literally means no thing, that I don't exist. Then he goes on to say that if I do sell everything I have and give it to the poor, that's what Jesus told the young rich ruler to do. Even if I do that, and I give my body over to be even burned, what does it profit me or gain me? Nothing. Because if I don't have love, it doesn't matter. I'm just noisy air that means nothing and gains me nothing. So then he gets into verse 4 and says, Love is this. It is, first of all, patient and kind. He tells us two positive things. That kind of sums it up. Kind is everything I want love to be. <laughs> and then i got to be patient with whoever I'm loving because otherwise I won't be kind, will I? 
Love is patient and kind. Then he switches to what it's not. And remember, he's, he's writing this letter to the Corinthian church who is being diffused of their Christianity by holding on to the ways of the world. The world says, I need to be smarter, wiser, more powerful to be somebody. Even to the point in my religion of gaining, I need to work my way to God. All of that is the exact opposite of what true faith in Jesus Christ is. I need to give up my life. I need to deny myself, take up my cross, and follow after Jesus. So he says, love is not envious. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. I still struggle with that one. You'll hear me repeating it and repeating it. Because 10 years later, you remember when you did that? <laughs> Love is exactly the opposite of everything that's natural for me and my flesh to do. And he's writing this letter to this church that is dysfunctional as the body of Christ because they don't understand God's love for them and how their love should be for one another. So then in verse 6, he goes back to, to love does not delight in evil, but instead it rejoices in the truth. It finds no pleasure in when people fall or harm comes to them or anything else. It's not even jealous or proud where it's envious of someone else and the good things that are happening. It's happy for them that they're successful. There is no, oh, I wish I had this gift. I wish I had the gift of music and could sing eloquent like that and I'm envious of it. There's none of that. Instead, we're proud that that person has that gift and I realize that the Spirit has given me whatever gift I have all to work as independent parts of the body to make it function properly to be unified and tied together so that it works properly for the head, which is Jesus Christ, our Lord and Master. Verse 7, it always, notice always put, is put in there, it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres. Let me sum it up. Love never fails. It never ceases. It never ends. Now Paul's going to go on to write that there are other gifts that will cease. The reason that they'll cease is because we will spend eternity in heaven. The reason we're given the spiritual gifts now is to tie us together so that we are the functioning body of Christ so that we can go out in the world, they can hear about our faith, see our faith, see our love, experience our love, and say, hey, I want to know more about Jesus. I didn't know God did love me. I thought God was distant. I thought that if, if God was real, why could there be the pain and suffering that there is in the world? But then I saw you. I saw your church. And I began to question, what is this faith? What is this love that you have? That's what we're called to be. To be upside down. To be set apart from the world. To think totally different. This way of foolishness, as some call it, the cross, that God would become flesh and dwell among us and lay down His life for us? How ludicrous! But yet it is the wisdom that leads to salvation. And no one comes to God the Father except through Jesus Christ. And the way that they're going to know that, the world's going to know that, is by our faith in action and our love for one another. Paul addresses, addresses the church in Thessalonica basically the same way as I mentioned earlier. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, it says, We remember before our God and Father your, your work produced by faith and your labor prompted by love and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that He has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit and deep conviction. So, we can't love others on our own ability, can we? We're going to go right back to the way the world defines love. Love does keep records of wrong. Love is selfish. I love others that love me. You don't get my love if you don't give me back something in return. 
And guess what? If love is taken away, then I'll just get a divorce or whatever it is or abandon my children or anything else. Because that's what the love, t the love from the world teaches. But we're called to be like Christ. To give selfish, selfless love for even our enemies. How are we ever going to learn to love our enemies if we don't love one another in the body of Christ? By keeping no records of wrong. By not being jealous. By not being a gossip or a slanderer or anything else. But love each other unconditionally and putting their needs above ours. That's the pattern set forth. Love is the greatest, as Paul goes on to say, of all the spiritual gifts. It is the spiritual gift that will continue. Where prophecy will end because we won't need it, we'll be in heaven. Where tongues will cease because we'll all speak one language that glorifies God. Where healing won't be necessary because we won't get sick. Love will continue. Love is what ties us together. Love is what brings us to God and brings others to, Christ, to God through Christ. So are we going to be a church that's known for its faith and for its love? Or are we going to be like one of these other churches that gets these letters? Straighten up, guys. Don't be easily led astray. Don't fall into other doctrines. Don't not persevere. Paul goes on to write to the Thessalon Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians 3.12, May the Lord make your love increase. Not just stay the same, but increase. Even to overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. Not just staying the same, not just growing, but growing till it increases and runs over. Isn't that the kind of love we receive from God? In chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 7 says, For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. Therefore, anyone who rejects this instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives you His Holy Spirit. Now about your love for one another, we do not need to write you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you are doing, <clears throat> you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Not just the church there, but their fellow churches. Yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more. Why? Because they believed without a doubt that Jesus Christ was coming and He was coming soon. And all these other gifts would cease. The time of coming to salvation through Jesus Christ would end for your family, for your friends, for even your enemies. So that creates a sense of urgency, doesn't it? Because I don't want my children and my grandchildren and my friends and my neighbors to die without coming to saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Nothing is more important than that. So Paul tells us not to let anything tie us down. Not to let Satan get one foothold. To strip off everything that keeps us from running that race. To train, to persevere, to fight so that we can live a life of worth. And if you've been reading in Genesis, like I said, you see this pattern over and over where God is so faithful. But we see a people that struggle with faith. We see a nation that was called out to proclaim the glory of God so that people would know Him. But yet they see, saw the hypocrisy of Israel instead of the faith of Israel. They didn't see the love of Israel. So what happened? Many years later, they rejected their Messiah that God sent to them. But praise be to God who's faithful. Now, the whole world has been introduced through the church, us. So if we are not the hands and feet of Christ, you can't go back and say, how in the world could the Israelites, right after they came out of the, the sea on the dry land, then just later say, God brought us out here in the desert to die. And we can say that so easily. How could God do that? Well, how can we not be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ and say that, yeah, I'll get serious about my faith, Lord, when my kids are grown and, and college is paid for and all this. You know what? He might come before then. Death might happen before then. We are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ today to show the world our faith and our love. 
Paul writes a second letter to the Thessalonians, and here's what he says in 2 Thessalonians 1.3. We ought to always thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. And the love all of you have for one another is increasing. There's a church that is doing the right thing. Their second letter says, things I commended you for in the first place, like I commended the church in, in Coloss Colossae, you're doing it more and more. And God was increasing the number of people saved. Isn't that what we want? Who here doesn't want their children to know God? You wouldn't be here if you weren't. But will you seriously take the gifts that God has given you and tie them together this church and be the body of Christ that we're called to be so that Bonners Ferry does know who Springs of Living Water is? They understand the term springs of living water because it flows from us, just as Scripture tells us. Love never fails. That's what Paul says. You can't go wrong with it. If you love even your enemies, they're going to wonder why. And that's going to draw them to Jesus. Love never fails. When Jesus was here... John chapter 13, he went in the upper room, starts his last teachings with his intimate followers, those who are true disciples. He's quit preaching to the masses, and he's preaching to those who have chosen to give up their life to follow after him. He even washes the feet of his disciples, the lowest position that he could take, and says to them to do the same thing. And then in John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, which you've already heard, it says this. These are Jesus' words. A new command I give you. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, will ev everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, you know that's not a new commandment, but it is new to us. Because we have seen God's love in human form through Jesus Christ who gave up everything to save us, including giving up His life. Totally new. The Old Testament prophets never saw that coming. We have. We have seen God's love in Jesus Christ. That's new. And we're commanded to love that way. To love as I have loved you. There's the pattern set before you. Then it goes on in verse 34 to say, so you must love one another in that same pattern. Not you should, but you must. Why? Because by this kind of love, everyone will know that you are my disciples, you are my followers, you are my believers, that you are a Christian that you belong to God, that you're born again. What, how? If you love one another. This new way that Jesus is teaching you. Two chapters later in John 15, this is what Jesus says. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. <laughs> Sometimes we say, oh, some of the things are repetitive. Yep, because we need to hear them over and over again so we get it. He's still in the upper room. He's still talking to the same people. And he says, my command is this. Did you catch it before? Do you remember what last week's sermon was? Do you remember what I just talked about just a little bit ago? My command is this. Love each other how? As I have loved you. Next verse. If you don't understand that. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friend. Because that is exactly what Jesus is going to do. And that is exactly what He has called you to do. If love never fails and you live a life that way, then you can have the confidence and hope you need for eternity. And you can have that peace and confidence about your family also. Because God is faithful. Now does that mean everyone will in your family will follow? No, because they still have the choice but God will come to them because of your faithfulness. He works through a humble, obedient, praying 
loving people. If you don't believe me, keep reading on in the Old Testament. We're going to see more and more examples of it. We have Jesus' words. We have Peter's words. We have John's word. We have Paul's word telling us the same thing. And we have their, their lives to be examples. They gave up everything to follow after Jesus because they loved others and they didn't want to see someone die and not know Jesus. John wrote about love in John, the, the gospel that we talked about. But he also wrote a letter afterwards because believers were starting to kind of doubt and worry and get distracted and pulled in other directions. <laughs> Just like the church today, right? Not much different. So he wrote this in 1 John. I'm going to start in chapter 2 if you want to turn there. He wrote these words so that these believers would have total assurance in their salvation. Here's how you will know that you are saved. Okay? 1 John chapter 2 starting in verse 3. We know that we have come to know Him, have intimate relationship with Him. How? If we keep His commands. Whoever says that I do know Him, that I'm saved and I know it in my, li my life... Oh, wait a minute. That part can't be in there yet. That I know Him and I'm going to heaven, <laughs> but does not do what Jesus commands. He is a liar. And the truth is not in that person. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. If the truth's not in him, I don't think his destination's where he thinks it's going to be. This letter's written to believers. Okay? And this is how you can know. This is going to separate some of the sheep from the goat with this letter when they read this and examine, the, examine themselves. Verse 5, But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in Him must live as Jesus did. I see a pattern here. I don't know about you. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a look at that, new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message that you've heard. Yet I am writing you a new command because Jesus set the bar higher for the church than He ever did for the nation of Israel because God came in flesh as Jesus Christ and died for you. I don't know about you. I'll use my son as an example again. But if I go out and try to help you and save you and I throw your life preserver and everything, well, that's fine and dandy. You should thank me if I saved your life. But if I throw my son out with a life preserver knowing he's going to die to save you, then you better thank me. God gave His only Son to save you and I so that we would live a life of worth empowered by God Himself who comes and lives in you and seals you as His very own child. Do you see the difference in this new command? Yet I'm writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in Him, in Jesus, and in you. Because the darkness is passing. Ah, yes. And the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother or sister, not their enemies here, fellow brothers and sisters, is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. But anyone who hates a brother or sister is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. They do not know where they are going. Because the darkness has blinded them. They think they know. But Jesus tells us clearly when that day comes, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord. The darkness has blinded them. Verse 12, I am writing to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of His name. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know Him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, dear children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. 
For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Jesus will return. There is a time now for people to be saved and reconciled. And the responsibility is the church's. It's ours to do that. The world and its desires will pass away. But whoever is saved, whoever is born again, no. Whoever does the will of God lives forever. Because if you are saved, your life will surely show it. You will have love that overflows for one another. Your faith will be consistent. Your works, your actions will be consistent with what you say you believe. James is very clear about it. Show me your faith without your works. You can't do it. It's dead and useless. If you love the Lord, it will show in your life. True believers are a new creation in Christ. They are born again, empowered by God. You have the power residing inside of you to be like Christ, which Christ calls you to be so that you can be a light for the world including <laughs> loving your enemies. <laughs> Homework. Galatians. If you don't want to read the whole letter, it won't take you long. You can do it in 15, 20 minutes again probably. But if not, read chapter 4, 21 through 525. One chapter. It'll tell you about living a life free of sin. You already have if you're born again, if you truly believe, power over the penalty of sin. But so many Christians don't realize that they have the power over sin in their life. Satan was defeated totally when Jesus laid down his life on the cross for you. You are a child of God. Satan has no dominion, no authority in your life. If he does, it's because Jesus doesn't have the authority that he should have. There can't be two masters of the same house. You love one and serve one only. Galatians 4, 21 through 5, 25 talks about that to a church who has forgot that or never realized that. 1 Peter says this, just to give you a point from another apostle. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. The end of all things is near. Don't forget that. People in the first church thought that that day was coming in their lifetime. <laughs> How much more should we think it's coming into our lifetime? It's way overdue, and we see the signs of the times. The end of all things is near. So what should we be? Therefore be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. And above all, what? Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Now applying that back to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, oh, I get it. That's how I cannot be envious of someone else. Because see, that love will get me where I'm not envious of their gift. That love will get me to where that statement that came out of their mouth that might not should have, I can overlook it and love them just the same. Love covers covers their sin to where I don't see that sin anymore. I see them as someone who was a sinner saved by grace if they're a fellow brother and sister in Christ. <laughs> because that's the way I view myself. So then I'm not prideful. I'm not self-seeking in my love either. Huh. So I can try to live a life of love the way it's that Christ has called me to live. Not by my own ability, but by the power of the Spirit. Peter is quoting Proverbs 10 here. It says, Hatred stirs up strife. Oh, so that's why we have divisions and animosity and everything else. It's because I really, the opposite of love my brother the way I should, so the opposite would be hate. I don't like thinking that I hate my brother, but if I don't love my brother the way I'm called to love my brother, maybe I'm guilty of hatred. Hatred stirs up strife, but complete opposite, love covers all offenses. If you're not loving, how will others see 
God's love. You are the light now. You are the body of Christ now. Christ went to prepare a place for you. A place you can't even fathom or comprehend. And He will come to separate sheep from goats and take His sheep home with Him. And His sheep obey His voice, obey His command, and they'll follow Him into the pen. Are you a sheep? Love covers all sins. Even our enemies will see our love so that they'll know that God does love us and He loves them. Peter came a long way after that time when he said, how many times must I forgive? Remember that? <laughs> to where he can write this, that above all things, love each other deeply, passionately. Live out your calling because love covers a multitude of sins. I'm going to end with Matthew chapter 7. That's what I ended with last week. The end of Matthew chapter 7 is where we see those verses that talk about a wise and a foolish builder. That the wise man built his faith, his foundation on Jesus Christ and nothing else. So the house that he was building would stand for all eternity. Rains came down, whatever came, winds came, and his house did not fall because his faith was grounded and built upon Jesus Christ. But the foolish man built his foundation on something else. Maybe it was Jesus and something. Maybe it wasn't Jesus at all. I don't know. But it was something other than Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And don't forget those verses were prompted because that day will happen when Jesus comes again. And not everyone will say, Lord, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There will be people trying to justify themselves, saying, but Lord, we did mighty miracles in your name. We even cast out demons. But he says, I did not know you. John was clear, if we know that we have confidence, if we know Jesus Christ, we will love one another. But the beginning of that chapter, it starts out this way in verse 1 of Matthew 7. Do not judge or you too will be judged. Verse 2, For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now this is kind of the opposite of where I've been heading for the closing. If you don't love others as you want God to love you, what do you think the standard is that He's going to use for you? I don't know about you, but I want to be a church known for its faith and for its love. I've been here five years now. If you come to the society meeting, I'm going to read a little report that I wrote five years ago. The report's pretty close to the same that I have for this year. That's good and bad. That means we haven't digressed, and I, there's some good things in there. But how much further would we be if we had the faith and the love that Paul talks about here and Peter talks about here and John talks about here. Would our church pews be overflowing? I don't know. Jesus builds His church. But I know that each of these authors said that we need to be abounding more and more and more. And that's my commitment. I hope it's your commitment. I hope that I've challenged you even today that if you're behind in your reading that you'll catch up. Because it's a wonderful thing to let your faith grow and your love grow. If we can see it, then the world can see it. And we'll be bringing people to Christ instead of scattering people with our hypocrisy. Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for you are a good and gracious God. A God who gives love, mercy, and grace to a people who don't deserve it. A God who brings adoption by faith, not by works of righteousness, but by faith. May we ground our faith in Jesus Christ and nothing less. May we be here to spur one another onto good works. May we love one another as Christ loved us and gave Himself for the church. We thank You and praise You 
We thank you for the times that we'll spend together today. Lord, we pray for those that aren't here today. And Lord, we just pray that you fill us with your Spirit and that we are obedient to what the Spirit calls us to do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.